I'm so happy to so have you I. here. It's really? lovely to be here. Thank you. All right. Um, you know, so many questions I want to ask. I don't even know where to start from. But it would be okay to start with your childhood. Yes. Is this something you always wanted to do, to be a commentator? I suppose in a way it, it is, yes. I, I don't think I knew it then. And uh, I certainly didn't believe it could be reality. Mm. But uh, I loved sport as a young boy. Mm -hmm. um, it was very clear very soon that I wasn't going to excel at playing sports. <laughs> I always liked words, I always liked language. And uh, from a, a very young age, I suppose like a lot of kids actually, especially today, I sort of pretended to commentate on everything. I yeah. commentated on normal family stuff that went on when I played football myself or other games I was always commentating in a childlike kind of a way so um, I, I didn't believe then that it would be my living mm. but uh, I always enjoyed doing it. Okay, well, what was your childhood like when you were growing up? What was it like? I had a very happy childhood. Mm. I was the son of a priest. A uh, priest? Yes uh -huh. and so uh, I lived a very happy family life with my brothers. We played a lot of sports. Uh, I had a very privileged education um, and uh, I couldn't have asked for more. Okay, I read from your profile that you were one time an accountant. Yeah, very briefly. Very <laughs> briefly. When I left university, mm. uh, like everybody at that time, there was actually then, within the, the UK economy, if you like, there was a job for everyone if you wanted it out of university, and if you weren't quite sure what to do, you became <laughs> a lawyer or an accountant right. or whatever, and, and I was an accountant for a month. Um, I, I went into this firm in London and started my training and so on and two or three weeks into that month I realized it wasn't going to be for me and so I, I stopped then I picked up my month's wages and, uh, and then I suppose was when I really started to pursue the dream of being a commentator well of was certainly being at least a sport uh, a sports journalist okay yeah. all right was it easy for you getting into that field no no and this is what I say to to young people now who want to get into that field mm. and say I can't get in, I can't get in. It's then as now, although the world has changed a lot, it was a very competitive business and and I used to write letters and apply for jobs all over the place in newspapers and radio and, and so on and I had a great big pile of rejection <laughs> until eventually somebody gave me a chance and, and nothing has changed to this day. If you really want to do it, you've got to accept that a lot of people are going to reject you and then when you you get a chance, you've got to go for it. Okay. Yeah. So you, you, you mentioned that you went in as a sports journalist. At what point did you decide that you were going to focus on football, not cricket, not hockey? Well, not that, was, that was a little way down the line. Okay. Uh, because um, I was just thrilled to, to be in it, and I, I do love cricket. You Crickets, do? Cricket's a, a, a passion of mine, and I'm glad I don't work in it because it remains a hobby as opposed to a job. Okay. But um, after a couple of years, mostly in newspapers, I got my first job with BBC, local radio in the north of England, in Leeds. And that was a great uh, foundation, professional foundation, because I had to work on all sports, even sports I didn't really understand. Rugby league, I didn't yeah. have any knowledge of rugby league, but I had to report on it sometimes. But mostly cricket and football. And I was fortunate to be there when uh, Leeds United won the English title before the, it was the year before the Premier League came into yeah. being in the early 1990s and so I, I had uh, a great sporting patch to work on um, and I, I started learning how to be a commentator and it went okay and, and to simplify the story I then got a chance on BBC Network National Radio mm. which went coming down and, and pushing back the legendary door of Broadcasting House on Oxford Street in London and and you know, you think, wow, this, this is something now. And, and over my uh, years with the BBC, um, that's the direction my life went in towards football commentary. And, and I also picked up that you used to write poems. A oh, little bit. I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't say I did that particularly mm. hungrily. Mm. Uh, I, I guess like all kids, I had a little dabble once in a while, but, mm. but uh, listen, other people have been kind enough to call me a poet. I can assure you <laughs> I've never called me a poet. No, really? Not at all. No, I don't. I don't, I don't. You really listen to yourself. Do you, do you uh, listen to yourself? Uh, oh, listen, I, I don't think of it as, as being a poem mm. or, or poetry of, of any sort. I, I, as I said to you at the start, I love, I love speaking the language mm. and, and I love the way that language 
undulates and, and the way it can come together if, if you're having a good day. Yeah. And, um, you know, it would, be, it would be really pretentious for me, and it wouldn't be true either, to, to claim that in some sense I set out to do this thing poetically or, or to <coughs> consider that I have some sort of special style yeah. because that's never been my intention. My, my intention always over a football match is to articulate that football match the best way I think I can. And to understand, and I always say this to anybody who's kind enough to ask, that nobody, in my view, ever switches on the television <laughs> to listen to me. They switch on the television to watch the football match. And you can either accompany that football match, and I think in the vast majority of cases that's all you're doing, Happily, there may be some people who think I might improve a football match and certainly there are probably some people who want to turn the sound down, you know, because they'd rather have the football match without me jabbering away in the background. And so all you can do in the knowledge that you can't please all of the people all of the time is try to articulate the football match in, in the best way uh, that you think and is possible. I remember there was a big debate on social media when DSTV um, released that uh, promo when you said that nobody yeah. uh, you know, watches the football match unless it's your mother. Yes, correct. <laughs> exactly. Yes. But everybody watches because of the game and not the commentator. Yes. And we thought that, no, some of us watch because of Peter Drury. Well, that's really flat. I mean, that's like, that, of course that's lovely for me because mm. everybody has a little bit of an ego and I'm, <laughs> I'm no exception. If somebody tells me that, then, then obviously I, I humbly accept the compliment. It's a, it's a, it's a thrill to know that. Yeah. But I, I would say, as you know, I don't take part in social media. It blows my Why? brain. It blows my brain. It's just too much going on and it takes too much out of my life and my emotional energy. And, and I, I hope people don't think I'm being standoffish. I'm really not. Uh, I think people who really know me would say well, I'm, I'm... Someone commented they, today that you're antisocial. Well, I, I really... I'm, it's nothing to do with being antisocial. Yeah. It's to do with being old-fashioned, uh, a bit of a dinosaur, and I, I really prize my private life. And so mm. when I finish work, I like to get in my car, go home, right. and be in my family and my group of friends. and. Please tell anybody who thinks that that's not the case at all. I'd love to be able to speak to everybody who's kind enough to want to speak to me. Um, but th th I, I, it, maybe I'm weird, but there's just not space in my head for that. Right. And, and, I, and however nice you're being to me now and that other people are, um, I, I can't convince myself that people, that, that people should be particularly interested in what I have to say, really. So I'm just happy to do my job and go home quietly. Have you walked out of a stadium thinking that you could have described a goal better yes. than you did? Yes, most weeks. Yeah? Yeah, well, most weeks may be an exaggeration, but often, yeah. Because, you know, it's like if you have an argument with someone, okay, if you have an argument with someone, how often when you come away from that argument you think, oh, I wish I'd said that, because <laughs> I could, that would have been the killer line, I'd have won the argument. Yeah. Uh, we all do that, don't we? We all think of our best line after the event, and it's the same commentating on football matches. You can, you can describe a goal, and then you come away and you think, oh, imagine if I'd said that then, it would have been so much yeah. better. So yeah, often, often. And Did you feel this way after the um, Roma-Barcelona <laughs> game? Well, that, that has made a big storm, hasn't it? That, yes. that, that goal. Do you understand uh, why? I, I, I do, but I didn't then. I really did. Was it scripted? No, no, no. no. It came naturally. Yes, yes, because, uh, well, if you want to talk about that evening, mm. if, if that evening uh, Liverpool were playing Manchester City mm. at the same time, and certainly for the British audience, the majority of people were watching Liverpool against Manchester City. Mm. Roma against Barcelona was, to all intents and purposes, a dead game. Roma had no chance. And I went to that game actually quite relaxed thinking nobody's watching this uh, it's you know what will be will be it's a great privilege to be watching Roma against Messi Barcelona in the mm. Olympic Stadium Rome what a great life this is and uh, so I certainly didn't spend the previous evening uh, in my hotel room thinking of things to say if Roma came back from the dead because it wasn't going to happen and and if you listen to that piece of commentary it is specifically about a Greek guy centre-half called Manalas, 
uh, scoring in Rome. Now, if you believe that I scripted that, because he was not a likely goal scorer, mm -hmm. you have to believe that I scripted a line for all of the other 17 <laughs> players who might have scored a goal yeah. for, uh, and I can promise you, I really didn't. Yeah. I really didn't. Uh, and so, I, th I think that evening was a result of being pretty uninhibited, really, because it didn't occur to me what a big deal but, Because he had everything, that commentary had everything. He had geography, he had history, he had poetry, he had, it was a mixture of everything. It, it, it just, it, it's one of those things where my planets aligned, you know, that's all <laughs> I could say. Yeah. And, and, and um, it wasn't really until, I forget exactly what the dynamic of the game was, but when Roma scored their previous goal, and were within one goal mm. of knocking Barcelona out against all the odds and you know it was impossible it simply couldn't have happened um, at that period while the game was ongoing I would say in my head I was thinking oh my goodness if they do score again this is this is going to be quite something mm. so uh, I suppose I would admit to sort of in the 10 minutes leading up to the goal whilst the game was ongoing priming myself just to be a bit more than just it's a goal but it's a bit of a special goal but all of that stuff yeah. that came rolling out was yeah. was spontaneous yeah. a few months ago i tweeted um you know expecting my followers to respond as usual and the tweet read peter drury once said and majority i had over 1000 respondents mm. and majority of them said once again Peter denies Jesus, and that was a game between um, Manchester City and Arsenal. Peter checking goal, <laughs> and then uh, you know Manchester City's Jesus <laughs> trying to score, and he couldn't I can't score. Remember you, can't, you, you don't remember no, that? No, I don't know, but uh, yes, <laughs> I'm glad I did because it's quite a clever line, isn't it? <laughs> but uh, I, d I don't remember saying that. Mm. Um, but uh, there you are. That must be my bringing up in a by a priest as a father. Yeah, <laughs> it, may, it all makes sense now. Yeah. All right, I want us to focus on the Premier League itself, the most watched league all over the world. You mm. have so many viewers. If you had to um, attribute the success of the Premier League to one thing, what would you say? Ooh. Um, actually, probably it's global nature. It's, it has become whilst it is the, the English Premier League, it has become the league for the world. Mm. Um, it, it has become the go-to place for the top players in the world from South America, Africa, Asia, as well as Europe. Uh, and so, uh, although Spain and Barcelona and Real Madrid would obviously perhaps be inclined to contradict this, as a complete league, it is probably the ultimate universal global, if you like, planetary um, showcase. Mm. Do you have a soft spot for any Premier League team? I might do. <laughs> you might do. <laughs> I might do. But you, you, of course you're not allowed I to. Know. No, well, I know. I mean, listen, it's, it, what, what I would also say to mm. you and anybody who's watching this is that regardless of any soft spot I have, any commentator will tell you, and all commentators grew up as children supporting a team, it's, you know, you can't be in denial about that. Mm. Um, the moment you pick up the microphone, that is forgotten. Yeah. It really is. It's a matter of heart and head. And when you're at work, your head takes over. How do you feel commentating on the England-Croatia game, being an Englishman? Ah, patriotism and, and sort of patriotic partisanship can, can catch you up, mm. you know. And people say, what would you most like to commentate on? It would be England winning the World Cup. You know, I, I can't deny that. Um, so I felt nervous. I felt nervous from a broadcasting point of view because if England were going to win that game, I was going to have to deliver a line at the final whistle which went along the lines of, and England are in the World Cup final. And, you know, that's the second best line to, and England have won the World Cup. Um, and I wanted to be sure that if and when that moment arrived, I was going to do it yeah. in style, you know. Yeah. Um, but even in a game as big as that, um, your, your head's in charge of your heart. I can't deny I wanted England to win that game. Of course I did. But I can also uh, assure any Croatians watching that I was determined to be, and I think I was, mm -hmm. as excitable about a Croatian goal as I was an English goal. I want to go back to the Premier League. 
What do you think about VAR, sincerely? I think VAR is a really good aspiration. Uh, it, if we can get everything absolutely right, why don't we get everything absolutely right? Um, at the moment, we're still not getting everything absolutely right. So it's a, it's a, we're, we're in this turbulent period, learning period, um, during which I'm just encouraged by the experiences of others, leagues who've done this before we have, uh, that they also had turbulent first seasons and gradually worked out how to do it. Um, and I like to think we will too. Okay, now back to England. How good do you think this English team is or can be? The English national team? Yeah. Oh, I think it could be very good. Mm. I, you know, I'm a real um, disciple of Gareth Southgate. Mm. He, he is um, a proper human being, in my view. He has uh, compassion and sympathy and empathy. He went to hell and back as an England player himself. He understands when it hurts, he understands the low moments, he understands the way footballers tick. And what he did by taking England to the World Cup semi-final was, I think, I wasn't amongst them, but I think unburdened them from the, uh, the weight of being an England international, which has inhibited English footballers for generations, I think, and not enabled them to be as good as they potentially could be. If he's able to keep that message robust and keep believing in the young players that keep coming through under him, uh, I'm really optimistic that he, he might be the one. Okay. Do you think it's time to have female commentators in top flight football? Yes. And there are some. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're starting to happen. Um, I, I see absolutely no reason why not. My, my view on it, for what it's worth, uh, is a pretty uncontroversial one, I think. That is, that for commentating on football, just as for every other job in every nation in the world, if there are a hundred applicants, the job should go to the best applicant, okay. regardless of gender. Right, <laughs> that, that, make, that makes complete sense. And um, I just want to bring in uh, the UEFA Super Cup last year where we had a groundbreaking moment for women. We had a, fem a female referee. Yeah. For that. How do you feel? I feel that that's great mm. because she refereed the game very well mm. and was roundly approved of. Mm. Um, again, I say, male or female, matters not one job to me. Mm. The important thing is to have really good people doing the job really well. One of the best assistant referees in English football at the moment is Sean Massey Ellis. Mm. You watch her running that line and I tell you her record is sensational. She never gets it wrong uh, and so there is there is proof in front of our very eyes that, that um, in those roles, gender is an irrelevance. Okay. Now, what do you say to a young man or woman who wants to be a commentator? What, what, what kind of preparation do they... Well, do? first of all, in, when you're at that sort of aspirational stage yeah. of just thinking, wow, I'd love to do this, the first thing to check with yourself is that you really love it. Mm. You really love the game and you really love... Um, the mechanics of the language because I think those are the two fundamentals and if you're if you're doing it because you want to be in some sense well known I really would advise against it because um, it finds you out you know it finds you out you either you're sincere about your passion for it or you're not yeah. and uh, you know you can you can put up some sort of a facade for a while but you can't forever so so that's the first thing to say Second thing to say is uh, be prepared to have a thick skin because not everybody's going to love everything you do and you will be criticised along the way, particularly on your learning gradient, you know, because you won't be brilliant to start with at least and you might never be brilliant in some people's right. eyes. And, and, you know, sometimes you read things about yourself which aren't good. And so the, another thing, beware these days, at least I started before social media, you know. Uh, <laughs> 
that, and that's a good reason to be sceptical of social media, mm. if I may say so. And how did you react to the criticisms? I, it, I just curl up inside. It affects me. I'm not thick-skinned. I'm not thick-skinned. Uh, I can take um, constructive criticism from people whose position it is to offer me constructive criticism. If my boss says you should do it that way, I'll do it that way. Um, and if fellow broadcasters or people who understand the job come to me and say, do you know what? That wasn't much good. Mm. I completely respect, I take all of that criticism. But if, there, if it comes from A, a source that I don't think is particularly mm -hmm. well informed, or B, just out of some groundswell of let's have a go at him, I find that really, really hurtful and I don't deny it. And yes, that does play into my, to my whole feeling about social media. Because right. I, don't, I don't want that. I know if I've been good and I know if I've not been good. Mm. And if I get that wrong, somebody tell me. Uh, who I respect. Mm. Um, so, to the people who want to do it, I'd say that is all part of the, the swirl of it as well. You know this, mm. you, you know, you appear on television mm. and sometimes you have to deal with that stuff. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, it's not much fun, okay. that side of it. So, it's not all great, but my final thing is, if you do get all the way and you, and you get to commentate on top football, mm. I, what a way to earn a living. Right. Yeah. Are you mentoring anybody to be the next bit of Drury? Well, uh, I, I help anybody who asks me to help, right. yes, and so quite often I spend time with with 20-somethings out of college or university and so oh, you know, fantastic. Who's like, yes, I yeah. speak to those yeah. sorts of people quite often, yeah. Who's your favourite co-commentator? Co-commentator? Oh, yeah. well, my regular's Jim. <laughs> Jim Beglin, he's my pal. Mm -hmm. I've been around the world with him a few times I, and, and he's brilliant because he's properly prepared. He, he's a very good friend. He agrees with me that it's about the match, not us. Mm. Um, and his analysis of football is outstanding. He's been there. He was a fine, fine player in his time. Uh, he's, I think, a generous broadcaster. Um, and uh, I couldn't ask for a better bloke to sit next to me. Okay. Again, in that DSTV promo, you mentioned that you're just a lucky guy who gets to shout footballers' names. Yes. Now, some of these names are pretty sophisticated, complicated, yeah. tongue twisters. Yeah. How do you get around them? Well, um, you practice, actually. I think that's, that's all you can say. Um, the, the pronunciation of names will never go away as an issue because uh, even when you think you've mastered one, somebody will come up to you and tell you actually somebody else pronounced it a different way and it's it's hard to get that and the, the, the classic one actually uh, in the english premier league at the moment is kevin de bruyne mm -hmm. and belgium as you know is a country that speaks french and flemish its own internal language and some of them say de bruyne and some of them say de bruyne and so if you look in the early stages of his english career there are commentators doing either or both until we finally landed on the broiler. So that's just a small example of a detail which sometimes gets under the skin of viewers and, and they rightly say, he's getting it wrong. Yeah. And you want to say, well, I'm not getting it wrong, I'm just doing it. <laughs> anyway, so, but, but the, the, the sort of complicated names, the, the Greek names with sort of 11 syllables and yeah. all of that, it's a matter of, of uh, practice. And sometimes I do uh, spend half an hour on my own just saying them out loud until they come naturally off the tongue. Wow, yeah. interesting. Uh, you, you do have a large following in Ghana. What do you think about Ghana, Ghana football, my beautiful country, well, Ghana? Your beautiful country, Ghana? I'd love to visit Ghana. Uh, we were talking about Ghana and football yeah. um, just before we began yeah. filming this, this interview, and I'm always thirsty for knowledge. When I think of Ghana, I think of uh, the Ayus, of course. Um, I think of Luis Suarez, as I'm sure <laughs> you all do, and your and your South and your, Africa. your broken hearts. Well, I, I think know. of South Africa because you were you were the African nation yes, that, that yes. impacted most on that World Cup, which was a which was a great World Cup. Yeah. And of course, but for that misdeed, you could have gone even further. You we know? haven't forgiven him. I'm sure you haven't. <laughs> I'm sure you haven't. I remember commentating on your game against the USA. Uh -huh. Yeah, and. Um, yeah, listen, African football uh, is, is um, a magnificent spectacle. You know, that World Cup was a never-to-be-forgotten World Cup, and Ghana's uh, part in that was huge, mm -hmm. huge, because you had such an important part in the African narrative. Um, so, 
you ask me honestly what I think of when I think of Ghanaian football, yeah. it is that. It is that, and it is, and it is the knowledge that at any World Cup, um, any modern World Cup, I, th I think back to um, Korea 2002 and the part played by Senegal uh, and Cameroon have had great World Cups and Ghana had South Africa as the prominent African nation and the, the African dynamic within any World Cup over the course of certainly my broadcasting career and my first World Cup was 98 um, has been what well, is critical it is critical you know in the global game and I, I, I there was a there was a famous quote was it Pele said years and years ago that an African nation would would win the World Cup by the year 2000 or something well, and that never happened yeah. but uh, you know I really would love to think that an African nation would win the World Cup in my lifetime before England before, well, no, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so what do you make of the Ghanaian players in the English uh, uh, Premier League? There is Jordan Ayew, there is uh, Schlupp at Palace, Achu at Newcastle, Amate, who's been out for a while for Leicester City. But what do you think about the, these Ghanaian players? Well, the Ayews have been a big part of our scene for, for quite a while mm. and uh, continue to perform well. Swansea, Villa, so on, West Ham, they've been at, you know, and... And um, the fact that they perform consistently at that level, absolutely terrific. Atsu as well, he doesn't get as much game time at Newcastle as, as he used to, but when he, when he gets into the 11 and he's, he's quite um, able to, to fit into various roles, isn't he? He can, he can play at wing back, he can play further forward, um, and he's a, he's a thrill to watch as well. Danny Lamarty is struggling because indeed he plays his role at, at Leicester yeah. and, and uh, is actually this season one of the best players in the league indeed so it's going to be hard to to displace him but again as i said to you about the premier league in general um the fact that there is a dynamic from so many different nations and that ghana can tune into our league because it has people with whom it can empathize and mm -hmm. people who it can support is, is a part of what makes the premier league great do you remember what you were doing the last time liverpool won the league <laughs> 1990 yes I had, well I got married in 1990, uh, so I wasn't married when they won it in May of that year, uh, and I had just begun my first season in BBC local radio, yeah, so yeah, I, I do remember. Yes, yeah. and you have been commentating on games involved in Liverpool since. Yes. If you look at the posture of Liverpool fans and the players and the yeah. management of that team, yeah. what do you think it will mean for them to lift the <clears throat> Premier League? This, even though it makes me very sad <laughs> <laughs> as a Manchester United yeah. fan, but what do you think it will mean well, for, for Liverpool When fans? Manchester United finally won the title again in the early 1990s, after a long period, it was the completion of a very painful cycle. Uh, and uh, the outpouring of uh, relief and excitement and thrill was vast. When Liverpool win the league, which they surely will mm -hmm. uh, this spring, it will be the end of a painful cycle. Now Manchester United and Liverpool have nothing in common and yet they have everything in common. They are the two biggest clubs in English football. They clash. They can't live together, they can't live apart. You know, they are they are the two great juggernauts um, and I grew up as a young football fan in the 70s and 80s when Liverpool were always winning and English football reached the stage where as admiring as we were of those great Liverpool teams it was kind of oh please anyone but Liverpool we've had mm, enough yeah. and now for people of my age the fact that Liverpool are about to win it is, is actually, nostalgically speaking, quite beautiful because it takes us back to our childhood and our teenage years. And for the people who actually support Liverpool, um, it's almost too much to bear, you know. Yeah. This, this is the unburdening of 30 years. And uh, boy, I want to be there when it happens because it's going to be uh, 
an extraordinary sight and right. an extraordinary sound. Right. I'm, I'm going to be wrapping up shortly, but I, I just want to find out, commentating on the finals of a World Cup game, and then on the final day of the English Premier League, where all the teams are playing, like in 2012, you did with Manchester City winning the Premier League. Which one would you prefer? Well, you're making me choose between them, are you? <laughs> yes. Well, there you are. I mean, there was nothing like being in the Maracanã Rio de Janeiro and, and commentating on the World Cup final for me for the very first time. Uh, th there isn't anything bigger than that. And so in terms of the, the um, I suppose, the overall career satisfaction, that would, that would be number one. But... You would also argue that as a commentator, the greatest thrill is to be there in a moment, like the Aguero moment. Mm -hmm. and you remember the word you use, staggering. Staggering, yes. <laughs> a few people have said that to me, yeah. it's staggering. Um, and, and if you manage to get that right, do you, you, you know what? The older I get, the more frightened I am that I'm going to have one of these moments and get it horribly wrong. Yeah. And so I sort of feel frightened about the prospects of each each big match as it yeah. comes and I keep thinking stop now stop mm -hmm. now before I I get it wrong listen I've tiptoed all the way around your question without really giving you a clever <laughs> answer and you're about to force me so if you were going to force me if if I could have another day like the Aguero day and be guaranteed I get it right that's what I'll that's take that's what you take yeah. absolutely <laughs> who is the greatest player and remember your answer could end so many debates Oof. Well, let me first of all say, don't let it end your debate, <laughs> because who am I to say? Who am I to say? Who well, we've seen them play. I... You've commented on their skill, on their yeah. bravery, yeah. everything on the pitch. Well, and I'm talking about Cristiano Ronaldo and Messi. Well, you want to? Uh, you see, I might have said Zidane. Oh. Who, who I used to love watching play. Okay. Who's beautiful, Luis Figo. In those those okay. years, you know, there were beautiful players then. But I do appreciate, probably this era, we've been fortunate to have careers running parallel of possibly the two greatest players there have ever been. Uh, and the interesting thing about them is that they are, whilst both brilliant, actually quite different. You know, Ronaldo's capacity for leaping and scoring with his head is phenomenal. I mean, he is an Olympic high jumper and an Olympic sprinter. He delivers across. He scores off both sides and with his head. He is brilliant. But if you ask me who I would want to watch play, if I had to watch them, one or the other, every day of my life, I'd pick Messi. Why? Because he, he appears to do what is impossible. You know, he, he plays off his left foot. He almost doesn't need a right foot. Might he can score perfectly well with his right foot. But he, he weaves through spaces that don't exist. He's like a, a slippery eel, you know, he's just, they can't get hold of him. He, he sort of defies physics. Um, and because he's a little scamperer, where Ronaldo looks like an athlete, doesn't he? I mean, he is a remarkable specimen of a human being. Yeah. Messi looks like the boy next door and performs like a god. Peter Drury. Thank you for talking Thank to you. me. Thank you Such so a much. pleasure. Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.